Hello, everybody, and welcome. This is Eugene here, and this is episode 69 of Forensics Talks. Today, my guest is Patrick Semft, and we are going to be talking about 3D printed firearms. Now, just as always, uh, you know, this is live today. It's not recorded, so uh, we do have a comments section, and as always, I like to know where people are from. So go ahead in the comments section and let us know where you're from, uh, what city you're from, what country you're from, wherever it might be. Um, and also, along the way, we are taking questions. So if I see any questions or if we have time, sometimes I forget because I'm busy multitasking here, um, you know, apologize. But, yeah, we definitely want to see what it is that you have to say if you have any questions or comments. So go ahead and do that. So we are going to jump right in here, and I'm going to begin with uh, Patrick's bio here. So Patrick Sent, he has a background in physics and holds a Master of Crisis and Security Management from Leiden University in the Netherlands. Uh, Patrick has held positions at the Flemish Peace Institute, working on arms diversion and trafficking in the European Union, and at the Heidelberg Institute for International Conflict Research, where he monitored the post-Civil War conflict in Nepal. He's been conducting research on cluster munitions, landmines, and chemical weapons. And since 2020, Patrick is currently an associate researcher with Armament Research Services. Here, he's responsible for a monthly release 3D printed firearms technical intelligence briefing, which is excellent. And he's doing a bunch of research uh, related to 3D printed firearms. And so I first saw uh, one of his posts online. And uh, this is an area that I've been extremely interested in and something that I've been wanting to discuss for some time. So let me bring him in here. Let's get Patrick here. Hey, there you are. Hey, Patrick, how's it going? Oh, hi there. All right. Well, Pleasure thank, to be on. thank you so much for being here. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Um, we've only spoke briefly, but there was a lot of energy there and a lot of excitement to talk about a lot of different uh, cool things. So we'll see how this progresses along the way and hopefully we'll hit everything. I have a feeling we're going to jump around a bit, but hey, it's my show. I don't care. We can go wherever we want, okay. right? So that's all good. So first off, I, I just want to ask you a little bit regarding your background. And so before you were with Armament Research Services, I mean, because you did physics, right? So from physics, you kind of went into this. Can you, can you tell me a little bit about the, the, the path to where you are now? Yeah, sure. I mean, as hopefully this show, I also jumped around a bit uh, profession-wise. So um, right out of high school, I thought I'm going to study something, you know, proper with, with substance. And, and I studied physics. My, my parents are natural scientists, so it sort of made sense. And in the beginning, it was great. It was the, the feeling of, you know, truth. If, if, you know, drop a ball, measure the time, there's no ambiguity there. That ball fell for X seconds. Um, but after a while, uh, I thought I, I'd rather deal with people in conflict. And then from, from that point onwards, sort of the, the love for, for certainty, but still wanting to look at conflict, firearms at first, but then arms and munitions in, in general became sort of the logical next step because uh, a gun in a conflict is among the very few certainties that are there. So the gun was manufactured at some point. It was found at some point it has a serial number on it maybe and from there you can draw conclusions um and so i i transitioned into what's generally called security studies so where you like research terrorism and, and violence and how people become violent uh and sort of that that has now sort of mixed itself quite nicely into into researching firearms and, and ammunition in in uh, conflicts and so yeah i'm uh, for for a while, I used to say I'm new to 3D printing, which I very much am. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I've had a lot of people eager to to speak, and and a lot of people eager to to show what they're working on, and and so it was. It, I'm very you know interested in in 3D printing now, not only because of the firearms, but also because the the people in it are a very interesting set of of humans. Yeah, as for me, I mean, as an engineer, I've, I've been fascinated with 3D printing because of what it brings to the table, right? So, you know, this topic today is is one area that I've sort of dabbled in with research and, and you know, sure. working with police, not 
privately or anything. Uh, but um, but it's also just a great tool, isn't it? Like the, the printer can print things. Uh, if you're doing research, you need little parts, you need little custom fitted things. Yeah. It's just amazing what it can do. Um, well, let's get into it. So, you know, the 3D printed firearms are, for some reason, uh, it sort of uh, rings differently than maybe some of the like a pipe gun or a zip gun and so these have been around forever people have been making their own weapons or firearms but when we start talking about 3d printing and weapons what what is it do you think that makes people sort of raise an eyebrow uh so i, I do think there are two factors at play here so one sort of the distinction between improvised gun and craft produced gun so we refer to as an, an improvised gun is sort of a very crude you have a pipe, you seal the end, you pour some powder in it, put a projectile over it, light it up, it, it fires a shot. And then craft produce are sort of the more, uh, that require more skill, more work, but also also are more capable. So if you think of the Ludi submachine gun or, or what's in the Middle East referred to as a Carlos, which is generally the same thing. Um, and so now, the, the sort of distinction between those two was always skill. So an improvised firearm is pretty easy to build, but also can't do a lot of damage generally. On the other hand, a craft-produced firearm is generally more difficult to build, but also can do more harm if, if, if used in that way. And so we've sort of the, the observation prior to 3D printing was we we're always more or less safe from craft produced farms because they are reasonably rare not globally of course but they're quite difficult to build and then that has sort of put people at ease but i would argue 3d printing has sort of shifted that namely that a it feels like a capable 3d printed firearm is easier to produce now of course it's not trivial not everybody can just buy a 3d printer and print a gun it does take skill it does take dedication but it's definitely more easy to do once you know how it's done yeah uh, and then the second aspect is i think the use of plastic so if you if you remember when glock public or oh, released their first handgun people thought they could uh, go through airport security were they now of course they can't but the danger or the, the feeling of danger was there and I would argue that the same sort of happened with 3D printed firearms. So the, the Liberator that was released in 2013 is almost entirely made out of plastic. And it's not a very capable gun by, by any stretch of the imagination, but sort of the, the fear was there that once that technology sort of matures and evolves, we'll be able to produce completely plastic 3D printed guns. Right. And um, so... A lot of the times when you look online, you'll see that people will have like these old zip guns that they're either single use, like they only fire one cartridge or they're very difficult to reload. So it's not like an automatic weapon um, mm -hmm. or uh, in the case of 3D printers, there's a reliability issue many times with the way these things are being crafted. Um, but there are some now uh 3d printed guns that are very reliable and are up up to up to par with you know uh, professionally manufactured guns would you say that that's true yes very much so so i think um again looking at what is out there with 3d printed firearms one should distinguish between 3d printed firearms that incorporate purpose-built firearms parts so for example you take a slide of a glock in a barrel and then 3d print the grip assembly and uh, 3D printed firearms that use metal parts, but which are not intended for firearms. Now, if you produce a Glock, for example, using 3D printing, so the, the grip frame, that gun will be basically as good as a factory Glock, if not better for economic reasons. So uh, for at least for, for a short time, they'll be pretty much more or less identical. Uh, now, if you if you look at the the other side, so if you just get steel pipes, for example, turning that into a firearm that can compete with a factory produced firearm is very much possible. So the the um, there are multiple instructions out there as to how to rifle that, how to uh, build it so that it it can withstand the pressure. That's very much possible. 
it does take a bit more work though. Um, yeah, for sure. Um, you you actually and I just let everybody know. So um, Patrick is the is it, are you the editor of the the technical yeah. brief that you give? Okay, so you're the editor. So um, this is something that I'm I'm going to show just a few little snapshots on the screen every now and then, but it's not something that is really publicly available. However, you did you did an article on classifying 3D printed firearms, and so I was wondering, could you just kind of go through the different classifications and the yeah. way that you classified it? Yeah. So. In, in general, sort of working with uh, firearms, there are a lot of terms that are thrown around, but where the meaning isn't quite uh, agreed upon. And so what my colleagues here did was go through the firearms that are 3D printed or involve 3D printed parts and classify them into three categories. And so we, we have fully 3D printed firearms. So if you think of the Liberator, uh, and then, so those are those that involve mostly or completely 3D printed parts. Um, then we have hybrid firearms, which is sort of what we think of if we think of the FGC-9. So uh, firearms that involve mostly 3D printed parts, but use usually metal parts for the pressure bearing components. So the barrel, the bolt, they use metal springs, that sort of thing. And then the last bit, is what is generally referred to as parts kit completions. So uh, basically firearms that are built out of uh, firearm, uh, specifically 3D, uh, sorry, parts that are intended for firearms. So barrels, bolts, that sort of thing. And then completed with 3D printed parts such as um, lower, um, what is it called? Handles or if you want sights, that sort of thing. And of course, there's a there's a divide between those. If um, if you have a barrel and a bolt and the springs, you are very close to already having a firearm. Uh, whereas if you basically start from scratch in a Home Depot, you you have quite a long way to go. And what mm -hmm. we wanted to do with that article was sort of outline or, or address misconceptions about those guns because we've had far too many times if you fire a 3d printed gun it'll blow up in your hand <laughs> it, yeah it can but it probably won't and that's sort of what we we tried to address here yeah um and the the interesting thing is of course so i'm i'm situated in germany and as a as a european parts kit completions are basically firearms here so in 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 Europe, the pressure bearing components are the ones that are regulated, which of course is different overseas where the part that I think accepts the magazine is the definition. So the receiver bit is the one that um, is regulated. And that of course leads to a whole slew of options when, when you want to do 3D printing. Right. And the, the way you've organized them here, too, you know, if you look at the durability and capability, you'll see that, you know, fully 3D printed, if it's all made of plastic with just a few metal components, very low reliability or durability, and they sort of go up from hybrid. And then, of course, the highest or most durable are the, the, the kit uh, type uh, guns and cost wise, too. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of cost, uh, how does each one of these categories compare? I mean, uh, so by by sheer materials, it's more or less the same. So by by, uh, if you just look at the plastic that you're using, that's more or less negligible. So a few euro or a few dollars, a few euros will buy you enough 3D pr printing filler material to to print the parts that you need. So that sort of translates into that price scheme. There, a fully 3D printed gun only consists of. Um, plastic filler and maybe a nail or something. So that's why it is going to be very cheap. A hybrid gun basically requires the same amount of plastic, more or less, um, and then some parts that you buy in a hardware store. Uh, so pressure bearing tubes, for example, and then springs, screws, that sort of thing, that ne inevitably will increase the price. Mm -hmm. And then if you go one step up, you not only need tubes and screws you need barrels and slides which of course drive up the price again right and um, you know it's interesting to see the i think initially when people were designing these 3d guns um a lot of people what they're doing is they're, they're designing the plastic components to replace the metal components and so they're, they're the same almost form factor or whatever and that's where you have a problem 
because it's just plastic is not as durable as the metal. But people are starting to get smarter. So they're starting to, you know, thicken up the plastic or whatever. But many people are still designing the parts to accommodate the existing metal parts. But what seems interesting to me is when people start designing the gun around the material that uh, you're, they're going to be using. And there are a number of different plastics that can be used, today, including non-plastic. So you have, you know, these composite materials and all kinds of things. So i um, just curious, but are you seeing a lot more original design guns on the market now? Um, so I'd say not as many original guns as one, one might think. I believe that's coming. So we're seeing um, designs that sort of rely on the quote-unquote lower expectations that we have for a 3D printed firearm. So if if somebody buys, say, an H&K um, submachine gun, the expectation is that thing will eat thousands, if not tens of thousands of rounds without any hiccups. If you produce a 3D printed firearm that sort of does roughly the same, it's acceptable if that gun needs replacement, needs cleaning after a few thousand rounds. And so you have quite an interesting uh, case uh, where somebody basically included a bunch of strong magnets in the gun that uh, increased friction of the bolt in it. And that sort of distributes the uh, pushback from the gun into the shooter's shoulder over a longer period of time. So it's not mm -hmm. the, uh, the bolt isn't uh, decelerating and then slamming into the rear of the gun, but it's decelerating and then decelerating some more and sort of um, comes to a gradual stop, which does reduce the felt impact, uh, the felt recoil. Mm -hmm. Um, but of course, that sort of changes the reliability of that gun. Um, from what I've, I've heard, still you can put thousands of rounds through it without a problem, but I wouldn't expect, say, Colt build such a gun and offer it to the US military because right. you'd have, inevitably, you'd have maintenance issues there. I think where we're seeing much more innovation is um, in suppressors, for example. So with, in, in very general terms, what a suppressor does is it gives the, exp uh, the, the gases that are released when firing a projectile a place to expand and cool down. So they're just not released into the surroundings and make a big boom. Uh, yeah, exactly that. Um, and now with 3D printing, you can produce far more different uh, structures than we could with conventional manufacturing. So we're not no longer relying on just baffles or wipes. You, you have what's generally referred to as a flow through technology where you give the, where, where the, the gases are basically just having to flow through a very long track in order to, to get out. And that is something that can be done far better with 3D printing than with, with milling, for example. Right. On, on the flip side of it, one should say that, of course, 3D printing relies on heating up a material so it becomes liquid and then allowing it to solidify. Per that uh, attribute, 3D printed suppressors are a difficult thing to manufacture because suppressors are supposed to get hot. Yeah, that and makes sense. And so there are viable 3D printed suppressors out there. They work. They're not yet comparable to, to factory produced suppressors. Um, but without, come, sorry, yeah. No, no, go ahead. I, I, I want to come back to the different gun designs, actually. And mm -hmm. uh, But I, I sort of skipped ahead at the beginning, and that was uh, talking about the actual problem. And uh, so obviously there's some differences between uh, Europe and uh, North America, or specifically the United States, because in many states it's legal to uh, fabricate these components and, and that sort of thing. It's not illegal, it's perfectly legal. But for example, Canada, where there's strict gun control, in Europe, uh, I know that you have uh, strict gun control. Um, the, uh, there are still a lot of cases, and I, I think a lot of people that might be watching this or listening to this would be surprised as to the quantity of guns that are being recovered now that are 3D printed. So the horse is out of the barn. This is not like a one or two, thing, you know, twosy thing. There are thousands of these guns out there now that are being fabricated. And I was just looking at some statistics. So for example, in 2020, in the LAPD recovered about 813 guns. In 2021, they recovered about 1,921. So that's, that's doubled right there. 
in Philadelphia in 2019, they had about uh, 97 guns in 2020, about 250, 2021, 571. It's like it's doubling each year. Mm -hmm. And so um, what what is the what is the sense or, or what kind of feedback are you getting, for example, in, in Europe or in other parts? It, do you see this this rapid growth like of doubling or is it something different? Uh so I have to admit the uh, individual police agencies hold those statistics rather close to their chest. But um, from what I can say, the numbers of, or like I get a report of a seized 3D printed farm that is substantial. That's not just a piece of plastic that has been molded into something um, monthly. So uh, an, an interesting case for our briefing. So we have a, a case every month that we uh, does, that we discuss, and I've never been short of discussing a case. So um, that's not to say that there's just one seizure every month. That's by far not the case. There are plenty, um, but the point is sort of that not only do we see the sort of standard liberators, if you will, over and over again, there's quite a variety. There's also quite a close uh, or short time frame between release and the first seizure we see in uh, in Europe. So, for example, the FGC9 Mark II was released, I believe, in April 2021. And then basically a year later, we saw one in Ireland, which is not only interesting because Ireland has, even for European, uh, in Northern Ireland, I should say, uh, has, even for European standards, rather tight gun control, Um but it's also interesting that it didn't take that long for for that information to be released and then to be uh, seen in the wild. Right. And there were cases. So I know just like three weeks ago, there was a, an arrest made in Calgary here in Canada for yeah. somebody that is printing uh, parts, components for firearms. Um, it's they've been used. Actually, I believe you did an article on the, uh, the former uh, prime minister of Japan. Yeah, that wasn't a 3D printed firearm. Oh, that, that wasn't. It, it was a craft produced firearm, and there was uh, people suspected that parts were 3D printed, but as far as we can say, there weren't. Um, but there was a very interesting seizure of firearms in Spain, I believe, last month. And that sort of is, is, is fascinating because the person, as far as I can tell, printed a piece of a firearm that I'd be very surprised if the person would have been able to complete because it is a gun that requires a bolt, so a firearms part in Europe that is only sold by few retailers in the US, which is interesting for, for the motivations of that guy. Was, was his intention just to see if he could build it anyway? Was his intention to just, had he access to that firearm? part and I just don't know about it mm. but um, what that sort of shows is the the ingenuity of, of those people and also the rapid uh, dispersion of, of that knowledge so that gun hadn't been released for, for quite a long time up uh, to that point and it was already being seized in Spain right right let, let me ask you about the uh, this article that you did here um, the evolution of the FGC9 what's the significance of this particular firearm mm -hmm. uh, so the FGC9 is at, at least at that point it was the most that was without much argue the most capable 3d printed firearm that did not involve um, regulated components so the the stated goal for the development of that gun was to use parts that are available in, in all of Europe that aren't and cannot be regulated. So it uses a piece of tubing for, for the barrel, it uses a few screws, some hex nuts, and that's sort of it. So the, the manual for the FGC9 actually uses European DIN-normed parts. So the, the screw isn't an American six inch screw, but a European 60 millimeter screw or whatever. Uh, and in that, I think the FGC9 sort of showed what 3D printed hybrid firearms can do. Namely, they can be almost or as good as uh, industrially made ones. So in that picture, for example, you see on the left, that's the Shudi. And the Shudi is sort of the precursor for the FGC9. 
Well, the difference being the Shudi uh, uses a Glock barrel, whereas the FGC9 does not. And the, the designer of the FGC9, only known under the, the alias J Stark, was actually situated in um, uh, Germany at the time when he was designing it. Uh, and so that, that sort of highlights the, the, well, the impact of that gun. And we've seen FGC9s in Finland. We've seen a version of the FGC9 being sold on a black market in Turkey. It, it does pop up in, in a lot of places. Mm -hmm. And in these, I mean, what, what is the motivating principle or what's motivating people to build these firearms in most cases? And I should say, like, you're, you're in contact with many of these people who are using aliases and are, are some, of the, some of which are very well known online or in the three uh, firearm community. So, uh, you know, what's, what's their motivation? Uh, I don't think there's a singular motivation that sort of unites all of them. There's a, there are quite a few. I think for, for quite a lot of 3D printing designers, it's sort of tinkering the the sort of the, the ingenuity behind it because it's not trivial to design a 3D printed firearm, far less design a 3D printed firearm that works reliably. So I think that's a that's a large motivating factor. And then of course you have people that design 3D printed firearms sort of in the um, following the idea of, of PE Ludi. So the the idea that as part of freedom of speech, there has to be the freedom to uh, share information on how to build firearms. And sort of if that ends, that, that's sort of in, in their view, a fundamental part of democracy. Uh, and in that case, sort of the, the, the libertarian aspect is, is mentioned quite a bit. Um, so that, I think that's a, sort of the two big blocks of, of people designing it. And not, of course, not every designer falls neatly into one category. Um, there are designers that very much say a government that prohibits you from owning a firearm is a tyrannical government and it is your moral duty to oppose that. Hence, it is a plan to build a firearm. But they're also, and I would say the vast majority of them, um, design firearms um, as a as a as a feat of ingenuity yeah. as, as something that is rarely that that is difficult and achievable yeah i think you're right about that i mean um i i've, I've heard some people talk about you know that it's, it's a craft it's an art or whatever and to the extent where some of them are you know printing like dragon's heads and things like this yeah. on the end of their barrels right so it's an artistic expression is what they say but but I, th I think you're right i think a lot of it is is just that it's just a challenge and it may be a hobby it may be a side thing i don't think it's all for you know bad reasons or whatever um yeah. Um, so let me ask you about, I mean, if you're in this 3D printed world, uh, you obviously have to know who Cody Wilson is and uh, Defense Distributed because they were one of the, you know, he was sort of the guy who kicked off a lot of this. But uh, what can you tell us about uh, Defense Distributed and sort of the origins of the Liberator? Oh, actually, I can't tell you a whole lot about that, I have to admit, because the, the Liberator as, as a gun sort of, or the, the concept of a completely 3D printed gun, uh, more or less fizzled out. So there are 3D printed firearms that are completely or mostly uh, 3D printed. They, they're still in existence. They're still being developed. But I think the, the most significant shift happened to hybrid firearms or even uh, firearms that then included purpose-built parts. Um, there is, and I think that sort of... Um, a case with a lot of uh, industries where there's a lot of craft involved and, and um, something that, that I describe as reputation. So people are known for what they're doing. It's also uh, something where uh, individuals can be sort of, um, can be attributed a, a bad reputation. And so I try and stay away from being personally involved with uh, with people like Cody Wilson, for example, right. who, as far I as I can tell, has sort of, yeah, does have a bad reputation among right, right. The, uh, yeah. these designers. Yeah, yeah, I understand. But there was a, wasn't there a, a case recently involving a couple of seized uh, liberators uh, mm. in, in Asia? 
Yes, there was. So uh, in Hong Kong, actually, that, that happened two, two weeks ago, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as I'm, uh, I, so there, basically there was, a, I think, a couple. Uh, so there was a couple and, and a third person that was involved. And the Hong Kong police seized two liberators and, as far as I saw, like a box of ammunition. So for Americans, nothing, basically. And for, for, for Hong Kongers and for people in China in general, a huge amount, if you will. Um, I can't say a lot about their motivations either. Uh, it's, of, of course, the uh, Chinese press would 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 like to to frame them as terrorists. I I cannot say if they are, if they aren't, or why they built those firearms. But what is interesting is that a firearm that was designed almost ten years ago is still being produced today. Yeah. That's sort of, and that's what what probably the definition of a legacy is in that regard. That something somebody designed a decade ago is still being produced and is still leading or is still being produced in an environment where you have to think twice about producing a gun yeah from a from a forensic perspective um what what is the difficulty with tracing these guns with trying to do analysis on these types of weapon you know traditional types of forensic analysis ballistic analysis and such um you know what what's the problem for people in the forensics area um so of course, there's the the sort of obvious challenge as to those firearms are rarely they they don't have any identifiable character, so there is no serial number on them. Um, but then there's also the the huge variety of of things that that can occur within such a firearm that makes uh, identifying and forensic analysis of such a gun difficult. Uh, so namely, if you think you a forensic laboratory, for example, prints a 3D printed firearm, fires it and derives data from it. Those data might be comparable to another firearm that was printed, to, to another firearm that of the same design that was printed fired, and tested. But if they used a different plastic or they let the, or they didn't store the plastic correctly beforehand and it got a bit moist, that changes quite a bit. So there's sort of in forensic analysis, there's this, the, there's a huge, or there's a bigger set of, of uncertainties now, simply because of so many variables that exist. Um, so there's um, basically what is done, was being done is uh, profiling the 3D printed firearms. Mm -hmm. So that's a technique that's typically used for IEDs, where the, the, uh, argument is somebody that made a 3D printed firearm or an IED work once will sort of copy his his modus operandi over and over again because he knows that works. And that, that is one way to, to forensically deal with 3D printed firearms. There is some experimental work being done in Australia where uh, 3D printed farms are analyzed for what's called deposition strayer. So the idea is that during printing, everything isn't set up completely perfectly. So there will be minor errors in the layers. So imagine a bump while printing. <clears throat> and that error will occur with a certain frequency. So whenever the printing app moves in a certain way or, or um, something happens repeatedly, there will be that error that will be translated into the 3D printed object. The idea is that that error could be used to identify firearms that were printed in the same printer, for example. Mm -hmm. They should mimic the same uh, fingerprint, if you will. However, I should say that's just experimental work. I've, I've seen it work in theory. It's there, there just hasn't been enough research to, to use that in a, in a uh, forensics case. Right. In, yeah, that makes uh, sense. That makes sense. And, you know, it's interesting, you mentioned, you know, about, um, well, not just firearms, but the ammunition, uh, grenades, um, all kinds of, you know, different types of things that could happen. Are, are you seeing any of that as well? Like where people are, are starting to create other things? Um, yeah. 
Uh, yeah, actually, I can give you a spoiler for the upcoming issue. We'll have a whole deep dive into 3D printed light weapons. So um, there are there's a there are num numerous users that uh, print what we what, what an American would call a destructive device, or sort of what, what a firearms professional would call a, a light weapon. So with like recoilless rifles, so where you have sort of a warhead filled with an explosive that is launched through a tube. We're seeing that um, also some some smaller scale development uh, from from a user in Eastern Europe who basically printed uh, projectiles that can be fired from uh, a shotgun type gun that are filled with an explosive in the top and mm -hmm. are supposed to detonate. So there, I think the caliber is like thirteen millimeters on that. Again, no sort of, uh, there hasn't been any scientific research into how effective that is. The, just the, the point is that that is being developed. Uh, and then I think the, the last thing that has been used in, in violent acts is sort of, for example, 3D printed um, Claymore mines. So those directional anti-personnel mines, we've seen those in Myanmar, for example, where, where anti-junta rebels used them. Um, and of course, that's sort of a shape you can do with a 3D printer rather easily. It's sort of a slightly warped uh, box with, with sort of some shrapnel and then some explosives behind it. That we do see. Okay. And are there any are there any places in particular outside of the U.S.? Because obviously the U.S. is, is probably the central location for 3D printed um, firearms and other things. But are there other places that you're seeing that are taking on to this, like taking on to the 3D printed weapons and things like that? Like, I mean, you've mentioned already a few places overseas, Asia and things like that. So, but any, any in particular that stand out for you? Um, I have to say not really. So there are, of course, the, the harder guns are to obtain and the more desired they are, that of course fosters uh, craft production of firearms and more or less inevitably also uh, faster 3D printing of firearms. So I think most famously in this regard is, as I said, Myanmar, where we've seen quite a lot of also FGC9s. Um, recently, that was the first time we actually saw them being used in combat before. They are mostly used for, let's say, photo ops. It's more or less of a, of a status symbol, because they, they look a bit more modern, more intimidating than just a beat up Kalashnikov. But beyond that, we've seen uh, sort of more or less um, whole assembly lines of 3D printed farms, so like consisting of three or six printers in Finland, for example. We've seen them in Spain. They're, they're popping up pretty much all over the place. Um, yeah, and so when I mentioned the... Uh, so we're, we're seeing some in the Middle East, but, but fewer, I mean, probably... Okay influenced by the more by the ease of availability of, of other firearms but it because of the internet there isn't a place that is unaffected by 3d printed firearms um, it's just a matter of what's the the easiest way to obtain a gun is it to buy it on the black market or is it to acquire the skills by the printer and then print 3D printed firearms. Okay. Hey, so talk to me about um, Armament Research Services because, uh, I mean, we've mentioned it very briefly, but I don't know, I'm not sure if people understand what it is that the company uh, does or what its purpose or its goal is. And then also about the briefing. I, I think uh, for those that are um, really interested, there's some, it's a really great resource. Uh, it's not publicly available, but um, maybe we can talk about that after too. Of course. So Armament Research Services is a um, private consultancy service. And basically what we do is we offer um, knowledge and, and, and analysis uh, support to bona fide or organizations that use them for, for sort of, that use them period. Um, so we, we've most, I've mostly been dealing with uh, the identification and sort of uh, classification of um, arms in the context of possible uh, war crimes. So when, in a place uh, somebody uses chemical weapons it's an interesting question what are those chemical weapons how were they manufactured where are they coming from who used them and for that 
ARIES offers sort of the expertise to do that. Uh, but of course, we also do we also do trainings. So um, we we have a field days for for NGOs that are um, dealing with firearms. So we where we take them out, where we show them how guns work, what they can do. We uh, for for now, of course, with the war in Ukraine, we're quite busy with that. We have people on the ground monitoring, um, dealing with with uh, unexploded ordnance and the the matter of how do they work, where do they come from, that, that sort of thing. And then what we're doing with the three D printed firearms. So we we had the one report that you no that you didn't show actually. We published one report I think in twenty twenty. That was sort of the kickoff with proper academic research into 3D printed firearm. And this is sort of the the briefings are the continuation of that. Um, where we're now seeing, as you said, 3D printed firearms quite often, even in, in Europe and, and in the States. And what that briefing is intended to do is give law enforcement and, and the intelligence community, but also um, civil servants and decision makers the information that are that they need to to deal with that sort of phenomenon so what well, those briefings stand out as they are all referenced so whenever we're uh, typing something up and the source can be cited we'll cite it we'll um so we're using the the connections we have within the 3d printed farms community to inform uh, basically the other side as to what's going on, what is out there, what's possible, and also, and maybe more crucially, what's not possible. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we, we had interest from like airlines as to, can you build a firearm that will not show up in a metal detector? Um, and that's sort of where, where Ari stands. That, that sort of question, those niche technical questions those we can address. Oh, very um, interesting. The when did you start the briefing then? And was it you that started it, or was it something? Was it started already before you got there? Uh, no, I well, the briefing was sort of a, a collaborative effort. Um, but yeah, I uh, the briefing started. So the first one was released in May. There was a, a rather sizable conference in the Netherlands uh, on three D printed firearms, and we sort of wanted to contribute something there because we've. Uh, that one report that I mentioned earlier in 2020 still gets cited quite often and we wanted to build on that, but we can't build on it publicly simply because we have to protect uh, the people we're working with. And so we wanted to give law enforcement uh, sort of a status update as to what's what's been going on, what's there. And we've had quite a lot of interest into this sort of project and that's why we decided to continue it. Um, right. But sort of the shape and form, the idea that we're doing a deep dive in a technical section where my, my physics background sort of shines through. So like the joy of explaining what I physically a suppressor does is, is hardly taken away from me. Yeah, and I, I think, it's, I think uh, your brief is also interesting because of the kinds of contributors you have as well. So I don't know, can you say something about that? Uh, I mean, yeah, I, I certainly can. So as I mentioned before, Aris over the years has established quite quite good connections within the 3D printed firearms community. And so we have a number of uh, designers, well-known designers of 3D printed firearms that actively contribute articles to, to our briefings. And then we have a far bigger subsections of designers that contribute less formal insights into their work. So have a chat about when are they gonna release their next project, what sort of are their experiences in, in durability, for example, which you can't really get from just the file. So uh, a designer who's actually doing very interesting work with electrically ignited um, ammunition. And it was quite interesting to hear sort of where are the weak points in that design? So what's the part that breaks the, the earliest? Uh, and that sort of, uh, thing we, we receive quite regularly. And then we sort of translate that into an, a briefing that is up to, to academic standards. And then we, we get 
that to to clients. Can you back up for a second? So just explain that electrically. Uh, could you explain what, what that is exactly? Yeah, of course. So if you take a normal cartridge, so a cartridge sort of has a brass uh, cup filled with explosives, and then there's a projectile on top. And in the end, there's usually a cap with some uh, chemicals that are uh, impact sensitive. So when they get struck, they light up. Now, uh, but that doesn't have to be the way. So you can ignite the, the smokeless powder to fire a projector also via electricity. And that's sort of the design that individual came up with, where he basically has two prongs mm -hmm. that uh, penetrate, or one penetrates, the other one sits above the cartridge. And then there's um, a current flowing through it, which sort of sparks an arc. If you think there are uh, USB chargeable uh, lighters that pop up on Amazon quite a lot, it's sort of that thing. And then that lights the cartridge and then uh, fires the projectile. I see. Wow, that gets anyone. And that's really interesting because it eliminates a whole number of components, doesn't it? It does. And so there, there have been some uh, firearms that use that or a very similar technology in sort of the established gun producing world. So I think it was Remington who built a sort of a precision rifle that had an electric firing mechanism. And what that, that did in that case was it basically eliminated the trigger pull because you don't need to exert a force anymore. All you need to do is establish a connection. Mm -hmm. So it could be like clicking a mouse on, on a computer. Right. Uh, and we've seen that electric ignition system in the weapon that killed Shinzo Abe, for example. There, were, there was a battery pack underneath and then wires running into the, the gun barrels. And so that points to people use that. That's not just a... A thing for tinkerers. Um, it does eliminate some components and also, at least in the design of that 3D printed firearm, it um, eliminates the need to extract a case because you print it, print the case in, in a brittle plastic through the force of the smokeless powder or the, I think it's that in that case it's black powder going off, it shatters the case and then the explosive gas basically uh, throw it out of the barrel. And uh, so in theory, not in that gun though, in theory that will allow for a more rapid uh, firing. Oh, wow. Well, what would you say is today probably the most robust 3D printed firearm? What's what's sort of the, the, the one that everybody says is the standard, is the benchmark? Uh, as, you, as you said, the FGC9, and there's a Mark II version, which is a bit better but uh, the FGC-9 Mark II is the most established 3D printed firearm with the, the highest capability. There are, in my mind, there are some designs that may be, that may offer equivalent or potentially even better, um, like high reliability, higher, more precise fire, but those aren't as established. So they are, they exist, there, there are plans that you can build them from, but the FGC-9 is without hesitation the most tested and basically the, the best 3D printed firearm you can get. Yeah. Um, and that's also mirrored in the seizures of 3D printed firearms. So when there is a seizure of a, of a sizable operation of producing 3D printed firearms, it's usually an FGC-9. So. Okay. And which, by, well, sorry, while, while I'm on the topic, I just want to mention it that on the black market, selling an FGC9 is generally financially viable. So the setup to build an FGC9 will cost, let's say, a thousand euros, something in that ballpark, probably less. And you, and um, there was a, a case in Finland, and I think the price for an FGC9 was 2,000 or 2,500 euros. Really, and how about uh, so for for somebody who's you know moderately experienced with building these, uh, it takes them what a week to make something like this, a few days. So what do you think? It takes a few days, depending on the speed of your printer, how many printers you have, uh, and then of course to to rifle the barrel, there's a technology for that as well. It isn't it isn't difficult. It's it depends on how 
uh, how skilled or how talented you are, but basically everybody can pick up the knowledge to do that. And it is a matter of days to, to produce such a gun. You had mentioned the Ukraine before, and I thought, you know, as soon as it, it came to mind, I thought, geez, you know, they're looking for, you know, people to donate equipment and, and all kinds of different stuff. So have you seen anything like where they're starting to build their own firearms with 3D printing or, or, or something along that, those lines? So um, what Ukraine has or the Ukrainian forces have used quite successfully is sort of small drones. So like that, those DIJ threes, those little quadrocopters that you can buy mm -hmm. and then it attach small explosives underneath those. Um, but in order to ensure that those explosives fall basically the correct way so they explode upon impact, you need some fins. And those have been 3D printed quite a lot. In recent times, I've seen uh, molds for injection molding for those uh, fins. So going away from 3D printing, but that just shows how many they need, how many they produce that is worth producing the molds for injection molding. But yeah, we've seen quite a few examples of that sort of thing. So like fins and holding equipment that has been 3D printed also in the first eight uh, category, so clips for what's generally referred to as Israeli bandages, so to, to apply pressure on a wound, those I've seen 3D printed. And I should say the, the Ukraine isn't the only example in this regard. So we've seen scope mounts being printed in uh, Syria, uh, simply because they weren't available. Uh, but yeah, Ukraine, of course, with those fins, as, as just one example, has taken it to, to a whole new level. Yeah, you had, you had mentioned about um, some research before, like looking at the the filament or looking at the plastics and sort of the, the stria or the, the way that the layers are being deposited. But um, what other areas of research um, do you see as being important to developing this field in the short term? Because it sounds like right now the doors have just been opened. We're at a very, very uh, early stage of this and uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know how, I, I don't know how, I mean, it's, it's, you know, next year will be, you know, 10 years that, you know, Cody Wilson's printed the Liberator. So 10 years on and it's, it's becoming a very, very common thing. So there, there has to be areas that, you know, people in forensics or in academia need to start focusing on. And I'm just wondering in your mind what those areas might be. Um, so I think, so there's, um, there's quite an interesting research team in Switzerland that uh, deals with the forensics of an exploded 3D printed firearm. So they'll take liberators, they'll um, take other mostly 3D printed firearms, fire them until they explode, which usually doesn't take that long if it's a completely 3D printed firearm, and then examine the remains and, and see what information can be derived from that. I think uh, a very interesting sort of experiment I've seen recently uh, out of Canada is um, there are 3D printed filaments that are water soluble. So they are typically used to build uh, support structures that you can just then wash away basically. But uh, somebody printed a suppressor from that with the idea that you can fire it, it works. I've seen it work with 22 long rifle, then unscrew it, throw it in a river and it'll be gone by the time anybody finds it. Now, of course, a water-soluble filament is quite vulnerable to moisture just in the air, so it's difficult to print a gun out of that. But I think that would be an interesting avenue for forensics to see, is that possible? If it is possible, what are sort of the limiting factors to it? Um, and then, of course, the sort of looking into the future, there are other technologies for 3D printing. So you you can 3D print metal with the sort mm -hmm. of laser that heats up a very small spot. Those 3D printers are far too expensive for, for the uh, average consumer at the moment. But of course, we said that about the 3D printers we're all familiar with two decades ago. So it would be interesting how that could develop into, into a system that is generally available to, to consumers. Um, and then I think the last avenue that's probably more or less less far into the future is other filaments. So um, the filaments that 
uh, currently being used. So the best one is, is, a, is a high temperature nylon, and you can print very robust guns out of that that exhibit the same or roughly the same durability as industrially made firearms. Right. No, no denying that. But it would be interesting, sort of, if you what other filaments are out there that would slowly fall into the consumer realm, uh, so that that need even higher temperatures to be printed, or that need different printers, uh, and then how that would translate into into firearms. Yeah, I was thinking about well, and we discussed this before, but you know, I did a little project uh, a few years ago with one of the agencies here in Canada looking at ammunition, mm -hmm. and. Um, of course, you know, some people are making their own ammunition, some people are buying it commercially uh, or, or whatever. I, I imagine it's, it's got to be a little bit more difficult in Europe but uh, to obtain. But, you know, again, thinking about not just the firearm, but now ammunition. So traditionally, you know, if you're looking at making cartridge case comparisons and things like that, well, if you start 3D printing everything, like you said, you might have tiny little fragments of a cartridge case or you may have something that just doesn't... Um, doesn't have the same kinds of striations as as before so you're really really uh it becomes a complicated problem and not only that but even the projectile so some people might you know use a you know typical uh you know rounded nose shape or whatever but there's nothing stopping you from putting anything else up on the front of there right you could put uh, i guess what they used to call flechettes or they you know so uh, you could put add metal nails or, or something like that have you seen people doing funny stuff with the ammunition like that uh, so yeah, there's a there's a company in the U.S. that um, is developing um, well, what what you typically call armor piercing ammunition. One should say they call it armor penetrating, but that's for legal reasons. So in the U.S., armor piercing is generally not obtainable for, or not legally obtainable for civilians. Armor penetrating is sort of not a legally defined term, but basically it's ammunition that is designed to defeat body armor. And what they're doing is basically using a small cup and then putting a very hard metal in it. And that cup then sort of has the, the dimensions of a nine millimeter projectile. And then if you fire it, you can sort of fire it and it will um, stay connected to that metal stud. And then the idea is it spins, it stabilizes the projectile and then makes it um, defeat an, uh, a, a, body, a piece of body armor. Um, I don't want to go into too much detail here, but basically the whole concept of that company is to they develop it, they have a legally in the US, and then release their plans for everybody to copy. As far as I can tell, that hasn't happened yet. So they, are, they have developed that ammunition, and from what that company has shown, it seems rather potent. Um, but it's not clear how easy that would translate to to a um, individual that would craft produce it on their own. The thing is that is possible. Uh, so, in in the US, also I, I should say, a armor piercing projectile basically works by having a very hard metal in it, and then that can fly through Kevlar, for example. So right. you typically use tungsten. In the US, tungsten is specifically named as a metal in armor piercing ammunition. That's why that company for the US uses other materials. But of course, an individual that does not care for the law is not stopped from just buying a rod of tungsten, sharpening the end, and then putting it in a cup. It would be interesting to see sort of forensic analysis or even testing of that sort of approach that isn't done from the people that try to sell you the product. Yeah, interesting. Um, uh, actually, Frank just made a comment here that I thought it was pretty uh, interesting. He says, uh, uh, he talks about that friend, oh, so let me put the first one up first. He says, forensically, this has been a nightmare. Thankfully, they stand out against the standard tool marks you see until they become more significant part of the open case files. Uh, so uh, yeah, it's interesting about some people already seeing this, uh, which, which I find interesting. Um, what you, you're, you're working on, landmines and and cluster munitions and things like this so um what can you tell me about like what's next for you like are you you continuing this research in that area are you are you are you in parallel doing anything with 3d printing or is that something you're going to do later on uh what can you tell me about the kind of work you're you're focusing on so um 
sort of the joy of what I do is that it requires the same skill. It's sort of an eye for detail. And once you, you have that and you find fun in uh, asking and then answering you know, very hard questions, it doesn't really matter if you're now researching 3D printed firearms or if you're researching Russian improvised cluster ammunition. Um, for me, I'd, uh, <laughs> I, I'm really happy with, with the end of COVID because I'd like to travel more to the US and actually experience the printed firearms myself because in in uh, in europe you only see them in like in days in case in residence so nobody can actually touch them you can only <laughs> look at them and from from a professional perspective that's just annoying i, I want to experience it i want to handle it i want to fire it so i think that's in a, in a short term that's um a way forward and then uh, well, so Ares is publishing a comprehensive report on Russian cluster ammunition use in Syria reasonably soon, so I can, can spoil that. Uh, and I'm hoping to be continuing that work in, in other areas of war, so in the Ukraine, to, to assist the international community in documenting what's going on, to give people a tool in understanding what's being used, what can it do, what can't it do, what are you looking at, for example? So uh, I'm hoping I get the chance to, or, or that project for Ukraine will, will come. And sort of a third avenue that I'm involved in in areas is the observation of gun markets in different countries. So we've published an analysis of the Syrian? Actually, I don't entirely know which one we've published. Um, but basically, we have people that monitor online sales of firearms and, and other munitions, and then that, uh, uh, yeah, and then that gives quite a good insight into the situation on the ground. What's the price for a gun, for example? And I quite, and I have to be able to continue in that. Actually, I remember we published one on Venezuela a while back. Um, so that's sort of the the third thing that, that I'm working on. Okay. Um, is it okay if I show your email address here? I know there's going to be, there's, it looks like there's a couple of people who already have access to the briefing, but I know there's going to be a few more. So I'm just going to show this, but um, what can you tell people if they want access? Can they just write you or, or what, what do they need? Yeah. So um, the briefing is a subscription-based product. So we, we do require, we do charge a fee for, for providing it. Um, and we're not making it publicly available, but we're making it available gladly to, to law enforcement and, and people with legitimate reasons to have access to it. So if your organization wants to subscribe to, to that briefing, just shoot me an email with how many people uh, you, you'd like. And I'm happy to share a, a pricing scheme. I'm happy to, to spoil what's in the upcoming issues. I'm also very glad for people to suggest a topic or tell me something they're interested in uh because that that is easy for me to to incorporate uh yeah i'm happy for any feedback so if if the issues that people already have access to were not to your liking i'm more than happy to to receive that but i hope that's not the case of course and yeah, uh any any insights any suggestions i'm I, i'm always hoping uh, for those that are going to be listening to this uh, audio, it's going to be patrick.semft, S-E-N-F-T, at armamentresearch.com. And also, Patrick, you post online sometimes, and you have a Twitter account, so I'm putting that up here. So if people want to follow you, they can follow you and find out uh, how often you post, or you post when you have a, like a new issue out and things like that. Uh, no, I'm, I'm actually not posting about 3D printing that much. I'm mostly okay. uh, posting about Ukraine at the moment, but... Uh, I try to post about twice a week, sometimes thrice a week, depending on if there's something cool that's coming up. But I, in in my posts, I'd like to show sort of the the what we at Aries do at this point uh, subconsciously. So whenever I post something, I'll have a source for for the for what I'm posting or further information for people to read up on. Uh, and that that's usually well received because it's quite interesting if you if you like find an interesting landmine and then I can say well not only it is that landmine and it can do that but has the Russian patent for it for example or something on those lines. So um, it's it's of course more of a hobby than than anything else. But 
I'm happy for anybody to join me to uh, yeah, find out what we can identify in, in firearms and munition around the world. Excellent. Well, look, Patrick, um, I want to say thank you so much for, for being here today. It's been excellent. Great topic. Uh, you've got a, a lot of experience and knowledge and such. And yeah, I, I do me a favor. Hang back because I actually want to chat with you just for a second afterwards. And I'll just make some uh, closing remarks. But yeah, thanks again. It's awesome. Oh, pleasure talking to you. Um, I, I hope I could offer some insights, something valuable to folks. And I'm happy to hear feedback. If, if there are questions that can be handled more easily via email, I'm, I'm happy to respond to those as well. Thank That's you so awesome. much for having me. Thank you. Hold on. All right, everyone. Well, that does it. Uh, thanks to all the people in the uh, Glenn and Frank uh, in the comments there and, and chatting away and offering some uh, really good insight as well. So I really appreciate that uh, as well. So that does it for this episode of uh, Forensics Talks. I am going to be back probably in a couple of weeks. We've got a whole bunch of new speakers that are lined up and I'm looking forward to uh, having you here again on some other topics. So take care, folks. Uh, wish you a happy Thursday. Bye bye.